So please ask any questions and comments. And if you're interested also in N equals A supergravity, go ahead and ask him with it. And please, Rabun, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, so no pressure. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for the invitation to lecture here. Uh, and uh, so my lectures come after a number of lectures that dealt with amplitudes, and uh, I'm going to build on those. And uh, they also come after a collection of lectures from Ricardo Sturani. So I'm going to not exactly build on what he said, but I'm going to try to make connections with what he said. So uh, as he said, um, he is interested, and many people are interested in solving the gravitational two-body problem. Oh, incidentally, my handwriting tends to degenerate, so uh, when it degenerates too much, please poke at me, and I will try to bring it back as much as I can. So uh, the story is about solving the gravitational two-body problem. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we we might want to describe the motion of two bodies interacting gravitationally. And, um, okay, let me try to draw a picture about that. So these are two bodies which uh, move and interact gravitationally. And we also want to be able to describe the gravitational radiation that comes out of this. So um, that's what we want. And uh, in a perfect world, uh, we might uh, want to solve Einstein's equations with some sources. So uh, the idea would be to just solve so phi stands for some matter and then uh, we also want to solve the equations of motion for the matter. Um, now, as I'm sure Ricardo emphasized, this is a complicated problem, and uh, we don't know how to do this, uh, unlike the case of Newtonian mechanics, where we know very well how to do this. So, uh, the best all-order answer to this at the moment is provided for us by numerical GR, also known as NR. And, um, well, this is uh, complicated, it's expensive time-wise, it requires big computers and so on. So, uh, and it also doesn't, you know, it has difficulties in various regions of parameter space. For example, when the masses are uh, not commensurate, if the mass ratio is, I don't know, 10 to, is about 100 or larger, things go haywire and uh, numer numerical GR encounters difficulties. So, uh, there are, of course, other regions as well. So uh, when you have such an untractable problem in physics, um, typically uh, we resort to things that we know very well, and that is perturbation theory. Uh, perturbation in what, might you ask? Well, it turns out that there are many things that you can perturb in. So uh, let's go a little bit through the list, because the list is uh, slightly long. So uh, we have, uh, for example, if one imagines that the bodies are moving relatively slowly, one possible perturbation would be in velocity together with the perturbation in Newton's constant. All right, this goes by the name of the post-Newtonian approximation. And it is the bread and butter of the current gravitational wave detectors. So uh, what does this really mean to be a little bit more precise? So the expansion here is strictly speaking in the inverse speed of light, if you decide not to set the speed of light to one. And uh, in this uh, regime, one has V square, which is approximately of the same order as GM over R. And they are both of order one over C. This is something that you might recognize as being related to the Virial theorem, which says that kinetic energy is approximately, approximately equal to potential energy. So I'm sure Ricardo talked mostly about this. 
So uh, I will not say anything else, uh, except that, as undoubtedly he emphasized, this tends to fail whenever the approximations that are included, or the, whenever the assumptions that were included here um, are not valid, in particular when this one is no longer satisfied. Um, Post-Newtonian approximation tends to uh, tends to break. So, uh, an example where this is not satisfied is uh, scattering. All right. So, for scattering at infinity, the potential energy is zero, and the kinetic energy is not. It's in fact the total energy of the system. So, clearly, this is not satisfied. Another instance when this uh, uh, is not satisfied is uh, almost scattering like situations but in bound problems. All right, so imagine for a second that you have a very eccentric orbit. Somewhere around here there is relatively little difference between a hyperbolic motion and this particular motion. So. Uh, Again, the velocities can be large relative to the potential energy. So this is another instance when post-Newtonian approximation fails and one should attempt to do something else. So uh, the next approximation that might be interesting is uh, this one. Pn resumed over V. All right, so just take this, sum over all, pos all powers of velocity. Of course, this would avoid the various issues I was just describing. This goes by the name of the post-Minkowskian approximation. And uh, it is what we field theorists might, co might call perturbation theory with no additional um, qualifiers. Right? So it's an expansion in G uh, of V. All. Um, and this is uh, this is uh, where we are going to spend most of uh, most of our time, or at least my time. Uh, another approximation that is uh, widely used. Oh, I should say, of course, if some kind soul gives you results in the post-Minkowskian approximation, you can always go back, just expand in velocity, and pick out the terms that you care for. Now, there is one observation that you might want to make here, which is that both here and there we expand in G. So one might ask, is it possible to invent a perturbation theory that does not require expansion in, v, in, uh, in Newton's constant? So this is Newton's constant. Uh, and the answer is yes. It goes by the name of the self-force, or gravitational self-force, as the case may be. And uh, so this is an expansion in the mass ratio of the two bodies in the two-body problem. Though more generally, self-force is about putting a small body in a large space-time. So uh, here, imagine that you take two bodies, uh, one that's um, light and one that's particularly heavy. And then uh, one could study the motion of this of the small body in the, in the space generated by the big body uh, exactly as far as powers of G are, are, uh, are concerned. So the first order is just the motion of the small body in a geodesic. The second order, maybe I should say that's the zeroth order. The next order it takes into account the slight deformation of the metric because of the presence of the small body. Second order takes into account the next order deformation in the, due to the presence of the small body and so on. So this is all orders in G. And then uh, that's about all. But then, of course, with so many perturbation theories and so many expansions, one might wonder what else, how do we put all this together? Um, and this is, uh, well, it's currently done in a variety of ways. But uh, in some circles, the main uh, the main method goes by the name of effective one-body theory. So uh, you may think about this as uh, uh, the 
GR analog of going to the center of mass frame in uh, Newtonian mechanics, yes. So, can you repeat his question, please? Uh, so, uh, the question, as I understood it, is in what sense this is something that happens to all orders in G because it's not the case for the small body. Is that so? It, it is still an expansion in the small body mass, right? So, it, it, it does take into <laughs> okay, so take some observable. And in this version, it is written as a sum of uh, m1 over m2 to the n on all orders in G. So it's in exact in G in this sense. Fix n and the coefficient of that ratio of mass is, it doesn't have any further corrections in G. Of course, as you include more and more such powers, there are further and further functions of G that appear. So. It, it is an expansion. It, it's a fun this observable is a function of many parameters, so you need to choose what you keep fixed and what you expand in. Does that clarify? Sort of. All right. Uh, right. So uh, the effective one body theory, you may think about it as going to the center of mass frame in, in Newtonian mechanics and separating the motion of the center of mass. So the idea is there is one body one effective body in some metric and one adjusts this metric to, ac to accommodate various results obtained in post-Newtonian expansion, post-Minkowski and cell force, uh, numerical GR and so on and so forth. Okay. Any questions? Other questions? Yes, please. So, you know, in electrodynamics, the first force yes. is a problem that is right? Yes. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, so, people doing self force have thought about this and they declare that there is no problem. Um, right. More questions? Okay, so uh, as I said, we are going to spend most of uh, the lectures on this issue. So uh, let's talk a little bit about philosophy. Um, in particular, the philosophy of this expansion and of that expansion, since they are closely related. And th this is, in fact, a philosophy that goes all the way back to Feynman. Uh, Wells, Wheeler, and Fokker. So uh, the philosophy is simple. You have a complicated theory, this one, GR coupled to matter. And uh, you want to describe the matter first and then include the effects of uh, further effects of, gravita of radiation later. So uh, the philosophy can be stated in, as uh, integrate out mediators. Uh, and uh, worry about radiation later. All right, so uh, that's the story. So uh, how do we integrate out mediators? So uh, you really don't want to integrate out all mediators. You really want to integrate first uh, mediators uh, that bind to the system. All right, so uh, if we are interested in describing this motion of bound particles because of mediators by a potential, or something like, you know, something that generalizes Newton's potential, then we need to figure out exactly what these mediators that do this are. And, uh, right, so uh, intuitively, we're going to clarify this, uh, you know, maybe later today, maybe, uh, maybe tomorrow. But uh, intuitively, when you have a potential, the interactions between particles are essentially instantaneous. So uh, 
if we worry about mediators that bind the system, then uh, we want mediators that are off-shell with little energy. Because if they have little energy, then uh, the time, uh, then, then the time delay between uh, emission and absorption of the mediator is essentially zero, so interaction is instantaneous. So one integrates out uh, these mediators first, and then uh, so this, as I was trying to say, if you start, if we start from Newton's potential, oops, that's not V, that's R, it corrects it. in some way. In particular, it adds here some function of velocity. Plus further powers of g, some more functions of n, of v and r. And we're going to figure out shortly what's the structure of these extra functions of v and r. OK. So, uh, while this said, one might wonder, so what is going to be the fate of the mediators that are not integrated out, these guys who are in principle, who can be radiated away, can they contribute something that can still be captured by a potential? Well, the answer is that uh, this, uh, that there is, that radiation that can be emitted can in fact also contribute to a potential and we're going to see that uh, at some point. Uh, but uh, the moral of this, uh, of the story is that you need to keep an eye on this. Okay, so, uh, any questions? So there is one question that I'm about to ask, but somebody uh, might already be thinking about it and wants to ask it first. Yeah? Yeah. Who's B? Yeah, this is a function of velocity. It's in fact velocity square, and so is this one. But yeah. All right, so uh, I stated here that this is the philosophy, but of course, like all philosophies, they make sense sometimes, but not all the time. So uh, the question is, when does this make sense? Uh, well, so the philosophy is always describing it, was stating that you know, we worry about radiation later. So you know, that sort of gives it away. When does this make sense? Well, when the radiation that we want to worry about later is in fact treatable this way, meaning that it affects relatively little the motion of the bodies. Of course, sooner rather than later, it will have some effect, and it does. But uh, um, it should still be within this approximation that this effect has to be small. So uh, an example is delta E rad divided by typical energy is much smaller than 1. Um, so for, a sc for scattering, says exactly this, that uh, there is that the energy emitted is smaller than the initial energy. For bound motion, this can be restated a little bit. Right, so as, as a bound system emits gravitational radiation, or any radiation for that matter, the frequency of the orbit, the orbital frequency changes.
So uh, a way of restating this is that for bound motion, the change in orbital frequency by orbital frequency is much smaller than one. And uh, now I'm going to stretch my graphical skills to the limit. And I'm going to try to sketch the typical picture that is shown about uh, you know, the, the shape and form of, uh, oops, told you it's at the limit. Um, of a gravitational wave signal. So uh, this, you can see it on the plots and pretty much everything you know, in, in, in the LIGO signals, for example, that this frequency, the frequency that's drawn here, is much larger than the change in frequency for each orbit. So uh, this is slightly narrower than that, and this is slightly narrower than that, but not a lot. And, you know, yeah. all right, so uh, that's the story. Um, all right, so uh, what is my task? I should say this is a self-imposed task. So my task is to connect scattering amplitudes and uh, gravitational wave observations as far as conservative observables are concerned, or at least conservative parts of observables are concerned. So uh, this is uh, complementary to, I guess, Donald's lecture four, maybe, if I remember correctly. Uh, or at least I hope it's complementary. Um, there's a little bit of overlap. Certainly there, is, there are complementary methods. And as I was advertising in the beginning, they will build on pretty much everything that you've learned in uh, last week as far, as far as amplitudes are concerned. We're going to take various shortcuts here and there uh, because uh, um, you know, quantum amplitudes are a little bit more complicated than the ones that are needed here. So uh, or to the relevant part of M. Um, the other part of my self-imposed task is to point you to open questions. Some of them are uh, potentially easily solvable. Sometimes, uh, you know, some others are perhaps not so easily solvable, but they are certainly worth thinking about it because uh, they are, in a sense, fundamental to our future ability to convince our GR friends that what we're doing actually is useful to them. Um, right, what else do I want to tell you here? Um, I should say, this is, uh, I mean, the way the story is phrased is certainly not a traditional approach to uh, analogous uh, to, re to results that have been obtained, say, along this way in, uh, you know, in general, relativ uh, general relativity community. So uh, I should stress that because of this, we have some checks and balances. In particular, what we derive using our new fancy amplitude-based methods should still be grounded in reality in the sense that they should reproduce the data that and the results that are observable or that are available from um, general relativity calculations. Um, right, so uh, I do have a plan, but uh, it's a little bit fluid, that plan. So, uh, so here is uh, at least the starting point of the plan, and it will evolve as we go along. So uh, we'll start with a discussion about why quantum amplitudes. And then we'll talk about an example, or maybe I should call it an invitation, which is non-relativistic quantum mechanics 
how to go from scattering amplitudes to potentials. Right? So this is exactly the same problem that we want to solve, except it's going to be in a much simpler setting of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, and then we'll build on that obs on the observations that we're making here to um, to attack uh, GR coupled to matter. And then uh, another thing that we want to talk about, that we need to talk about, is about classical limits. I'm sure you have encountered classical limits before, and uh, perhaps some of you are thinking, okay, so uh, these are amplitudes, we're talking about classical physics, I know that h bar goes to zero in the classical limit. I know that I was told in field theory classes that h bar to zero singles out the trees, so what is this fellow talking about? Uh, it's a long blah blah about trees. Um, hold that thought for a little while, and uh, we will clarify a statement that was made, I suppose, in uh, Zvi's talk, that what you've heard before is not always correct. So uh, classical limits, and emphasis on S. Um, then uh, we're going to talk, so the, pretty much this is where we will end today, I assume. Um, then uh, we're going to talk about observables. Observables. Um, first generating function. And then a Hamiltonian, or maybe an effective field theory that gives us a Hamiltonian. And then uh, we're going to see an example here. The first post-Minkowskian order potential, which is uh, about determining this function here, this function of V square. And we're going to look at it both for GR and for um, QED. And uh, at least the QED part, I, understood, I understand that you had a little bit of an exercise last, uh, last week from Zvi about this. So. And then, uh, anyway, so this is uh, probably, um, um, you know, part about tomorrow's uh, uh, lectures. And then we're going to go from here. So let me be very brief about that. So we're going to discuss uh, the 2 p.m. order, which is uh, this order g square. Then we're going to comment, uh, we're going to discuss higher loops, higher orders, that is. There are no loops just yet. And issues in particular. And then we're going to also talk very briefly about how to connect uh, scattering to uh, bound states. And then uh, a few other things. So this will be, as in Donald's case, increasingly vaguer as time goes on. All right, uh, any questions? Any further questions? All right, so... Uh, So uh, let's start with a more collection of whys. Okay, so uh, first of all, why amplitudes? Um, well, there are many answers to this question. Uh, So in particular, let's start with why quantum amplitudes. Uh, if there were only classical amplitudes, then uh, the answer could potentially be fairly straightforward. So uh, in Newtonian mechanics, for example, if we know the motion on, um, say, on a hyperbolic orbit, we can reconstruct a potential, and then we can take that potential, change boundary conditions, and study bound problems. 
So that if we had just classical amplitudes, we could answer that way. So uh, uh, we will see later that in GR, this is not entirely accurate. And at some point, this story breaks a little bit. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the open questions that I was alluding to. But perhaps more importantly, why quantum amplitudes? And what is their relation to classical physics? So um, here is, there, there are at least two, um, and two comments that one can make about this. So uh, one, um, so if you attempt to solve classical equations of motion in a field theory, let's take a very simple field theory with Lagrangian, um, I don't know, for lack of a better name, let's call it phi. And let's add a source, call it rho. Right, so if we want to solve the equations of motion in this classical, in this field theory, uh, we need to solve box plus m square phi equals, let's add some signs here just to make my life easier. Um, right, so uh, what we usually do th with this is we start with, uh, uh, we write a, s a solution phi, which is, some lambda phi n, and then we plug this in there, lambda to the n phi n, and identify the various things that contribute to phi n. And if we do this, we obtain um, the following pictorial solution. So this is, uh, this guy is morally one over box plus m square. So this line is a standard propagator, and the cross is a row. This row is a source. So if we iterate this, we find this is the first term. And then we have contributions from vertices. And then we have lots of contributions from vertices. And so on. So uh, if you actually work this out and you stare at the combinatorics that you get in here, and you also stare at these pictures. You, you notice that you've encountered these pictures before, right? This is just, these, each of these are just three level amplitudes in this particular theory, right? So this is the three point with two of, uh, two of the fields attached to sources. These are three uh, of the fields attached to sources. This guy here is in a sense of shell, but you can put it back on shell and then it's, uh, you can put it back on the free shell. And then this is just uh, the three level expansion. So this is a clear indication that scattering amplitudes, at least three-level scattering amplitudes, are very closely related to solutions to the equations of motion, which is exactly what we wanted to solve before. Now, there is another, perhaps, uh, so, yeah, there, there is another, perhaps, slightly more uh, intuitive picture why amplitudes. Well, so amplitudes, um, describe transitions between some initial state and some final state, right? Now, in quantum mechanics, we can pick the initial state, and then we get to scan over final states, and then, uh, you know, pretty much anything that's allowed by symmetries and uh, conservation laws is something that will appear, that will have such an overlap, and they will, uh, uh, they will all be non-zero, so non-zero. Um, as allowed by symmetries. So, uh, but you also encounter this under a different name in quantum mechanics, right? This is also the S matrix. Once you impose suitable boundary conditions or suitable forms for these guys, if you push them, say, to t equals plus and minus infinity, then this is literally the S matrix and we know it, as we know it. Now, um, imagine that you now look at this and ask, uh, wh who's the largest? So 
again, what is the this matrix? What is the state psi final so that this matrix element is the largest relative to all the other matrix elements? Well, if you think about it, uh, you will quickly conclude that psi f is a cla is a classical state. Essentially because the classical state is the one for which, at least when we are close to classical limit, the classical outgoing state is the one that has the largest probability. And all the other ones, they're there, but they will all be quantum suppressed. And uh, morally, this is because classical mechanics is deterministic. There will be a single psi f that will dominate in some classical limit. So now, this I should say, this is not in any sense, the way calculations are being done, but it does indicate that there is a relation between S matrices and classical physics. Right? Just uh, construct the states which maximize, in some sense, the transition amplitude. Okay. So uh, this is uh, one of the reasons why we attempt to uh, relate amplitudes and classical physics. Another one is perhaps more pragmatic. <laughs> Uh, and that is that we know how to compute scattering amplitudes really well. And uh, uh, this, uh, I'm not going to review the various methods for computing them. You've encountered them last week and uh, um, uh, I would like to hope that you also remember them from last week. Um, and then there is a third one. There is a third reason why we would like to focus on amplitudes to construct classical physics out of it. And that is scattering amplitudes are invariant under field redefinitions. So differently, they are gauge invariant, as Donald was describing. So uh, knowing M, knowing scattering amplitude, we don't need to worry about what, what gauge did we pick, as long as we picked a legal one. Um, what are the fields that we put the Lagrangian, that we use in the Lagrangian? How exactly do we choose to parameterize, um, say, the Einstein-Hilbert action? How do we carry out that expansion? None of that has any relevance for the expression of M. So uh, we would like to use M as much, uh, amplitude as much as possible. Now, of course, uh, we are going to uh, do some violence to it. And uh, we are going to construct out of it something that, at some point, something that is not gauge invariant. And we're going to call it Hamiltonian uh, or Newton potential plus corrections. So uh, why would we do such a thing? Take something beautiful and construct something that's not gauge invariant. And, uh, um, well, there are many ways of saying this, but one way of saying it is that because they told me to, right? So uh, people who came before us and they did a lot of work, they worried a lot about Hamiltonians, and we would like to use that information. This is part of, uh, um, you know, having data to compare with, right? So, uh, and moreover, for pretty much everything that's done, that's, uh, that goes into, say, the effective one body theory, the Hamiltonian is important. So uh, in our dream of supplying our GR friends with useful bits of physics, um, we construct H and hand it over. So um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's why we are going to worry about uh, Hamiltonians. We are also going to bypass Hamiltonians at some point. So. Uh, don't give up hope. Now, another question that you might ask is why about why exactly should we worry about uh, quantum amplitudes and not just classical amplitudes? Uh, well, the answer is relatively quick here. Uh, in quantum mechanics, we use notions that in classical mechanics we don't really encounter all that often, like uh, unitarity. 
And I don't mean unitarity as a means of computing amplitude, I mean unitarity as a concept, conservation of probability. So uh, this is not something that we worry about in classical physics, but it has uh, remarkably strong implications on the structure of scattering amplitudes and on our ability to compute them. So uh, using unitarity as much as we can uh, is a means to um, constructing amplitudes a lot simpler and a lot quicker. So that's why we might want to look at them from a quantum mechanical point of view and extract classical physics some, at some point down the road. Though uh, that point should really, be, uh, uh, should really be relatively close to the beginning because as you might have uh, noticed last week, some of the quantum amplitudes tend to be complicated and the classical ones we're going to see they're actually quite simple. All right, so uh, any questions? This was a lot of philosophy, uh, right? It was 40 minutes of philosophy, so let's do some calculations. But uh, before doing some calculations, uh, are, there any, are there any philosophical questions? <laughs> yeah. Which one? This one? Yes, that's correct. That's great. Where, hold that thought, where, uh, this was, again, this was an intuitive, uh, sort of a, an intuitive reasoning why we should worry about amplitudes, as we're going to see soon, I hope, um, it, things go beyond this, yeah. yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. Okay. Can, We're you, going to talk can, about, yes, yeah. uh, can you repeat his question? So, please. he is bothered by the minimal action principle versus uh, uh, the path integral use. Right? So, uh, yes, we are going to use the path integral. And yes, we are going to use the minimal action principle. And yes, we are going to connect them. And uh, we will see exactly what the connection is. The short version is that uh, the connection is provided by Legendre transform. And uh, you know, another, another bit to think about is think about um, thermodynamics. Right? So you can formulate thermodynamics in terms of internal energy, in terms of the free energy, in terms of Gibbs potential, in terms of somebody else's potential. Uh, so there is a connection between them, and that is Legendre transforms. And it all depends on exactly what you choose to keep fixed when you vary things. Right? So when we use uh, minimal action principle, we tend to keep fixed coordinates. When we do scattering or path integrals, we would like to keep fixed something else, like energies, angular momenta, and so on. So that's the, the connection between the two is exactly in the same sense as in thermodynamics. It's a Legendre transform. Yeah. because it gives me a way to throw away things that uh, I don't care about, and because it constrains things more than what the equations of motion do, at least superficially. I, I believe there is a way to implement in, in solving equations of motion something like unitarity. I don't know how to do it, but uh, it's perhaps something that's worth thinking about. More questions? All right, so So here is what we want to do, basically. Imagine that some kind soul all right, let's be a kind soul here. Uh, don't know. Uh, walks in and hands us some scattering amplitude in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Right, so uh, some. Right, so uh, just just to review. So uh, this, what does this mean? It means that he handed us the following the following wave function. So he handed us a solution to uh, a stationary solution to the uh, to Schrodinger's equation, um, and that equation looks more like more or less like this. So.
So uh, he handed us I, uh, which is uh, e to the i e t. Psi, um, all right, this is going to be capital Psi. And then uh, this Psi, the other Psi, looks at infinity like Psi in plus e to i k r over r fk. So uh, he handed us this fk. And uh, he is asking us to find this. Let's also assume that there is a free parameter in there, which we later on are going to call coupling constant. Uh, let's call it epsilon. And, uh, uh, or if you wish, h bar, but not necessarily h bar. So uh, he is asking us to find this v of r and epsilon. So uh, the question is, how do we do this? Of course, to leading order in something, uh, all one has to do is uh, you know, take the Fourier transform of this and find V. That would be the leading term in the Born approximation. But that is something that should be self-consistently correct in the sense that if you were to look at the next order in the Born expansion, the V that was constructed should still, be, should still give the next order in the Born expansion. So uh, the question is, how do we find this V self-consistently? And I hope you see what this uh, has to do with our little story. And we, in principle, have ways of computing this, of computing amplitudes as a function of some coupling constant, which we're going to call g. So uh, uh, we want to construct something like Schrodinger's, uh, something like Schrodinger's equation that would give us a potential as a function of Newton's constant, given some amplitudes. Right? So that, that's uh, that's the that's the story. So, uh, in principle, uh, how, do we do how do we do this? Well, uh, there is uh, the sequence. There's a sequence of, there's a procedure. There's a step-by-step -step procedure. So, uh, let's assume that this is some function of this epsilon. So, uh, step number one is assume that you have that this potential that we are looking for is itself a series in epsilon. Uh, if le let's let's also assume that Donald is kind and he is giving us something that doesn't depend on one over epsilon. So, with that in mind, we are going to. Sorry, Donald, I'm picking on you. <laughs> I'm saying only nice things. <laughs> um, right, so uh, um, we assume that V is of this form. If it so happens that this is not true, then the solution to Schrodinger's equation is going to come and hit us over the head and say, no, you made that lousy assumption. And then uh, step two is solve Schrodinger's equation. Formally, for this V, and uh, that should give us some formal expressions for Fk of epsilon as an expansion in epsilon. And then uh, take this, AQA them with that, and solve. So that's, that's the story. Okay, so uh, I seem to be running very quickly out of time. So. Uh, I'm going to rely on your uh, memories of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, let's see. So uh, anyway, so we just made this assumption. So let's solve uh, Schrodinger's equation. So uh, the idea is, uh, so uh, Schrodinger's equation remains this one. So let's rewrite it a little bit. So it's nabla square uh, minus k square. So k square is 2me. And then uh, let's call u the potential. So u is 2mv. And uh, we want to solve this one. 
So uh, the usual way of solving the usual way of solving this is to write psi of r uh, to rewrite this as an integral equation basically, and then uh, uh, expand. So uh, so this is a solution at infinity, and then we write this as. Uh, G of R and R prime, U of R prime, Psi of R prime. So uh, what is this G? G is uh, the Green's function is the Green's function for uh, the free part of Schrodinger's equation. And there are, of course, two of these. And we're going to pick the one that gives us an outgoing wave. Step. And uh, the form of that, g plus far and r prime, is in fact um, for the level of precision that I'm going to use here, the 1 over 4 pi's can be thrown out. Uh, it's that. Um, maybe I should call it of r. And if you want r and r prime, then it's r minus r prime everywhere. OK. And then uh, the next thing that we're going to assume, which is a standard assumption in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, but uh, it's something that, to some extent, will fail for us, uh, is that uh, so the assumption is that this v will have a finite extent. So if V has a finite extent, let's, uh, so this is the range of V, and uh, this is the origin, and uh, we want to do observations some far away, at some point far away. So this is our R, this is our R prime. So this is R here. R prime runs over the range of the potential. So uh, that integral here samples the entire region covered by R. So this is uh, r minus r prime. So uh, g plus of r and r prime becomes in this uh, limit in which r is very large. Uh, it becomes it's minus 1 over 4 pi e to i k r over r. It's exactly the same factor that's uh, somewhere here, this one. And then there is another factor here that is uh, e to minus i k. This is uh, that. And then uh, u dotted into r prime. So uh, this is u, unit vector along r. And uh, r prime is uh, this. OK, so uh, with this in hand, we can. Uh, Take this, plug it back in there, and crank through. So uh, what we're going to see here is uh, the following. So. What are we going to see here? We're going to so find the psi of our prime. So uh, uh, homework for you. Uh, Take this, plug it in there, and obtain what I'm going to write. So, uh, so this is just uh, solving this iteratively. I k in dot r prime uh, plus. So uh, uh, while perhaps the details are 
not clear intuitively. I guess you can see where these are coming from. This is the incoming wave function. This term is one iteration of this uh, integral equation with the initial wave function stuck in there. This is the next order, and then the dots are the next order. And the, yeah. This one? So uh, let's assume, so this is some R index V, some typical scale of the potential. And we want to, uh, so usually we measure S matrices at infinity. So this point where we want to go to is, is far away. So this is uh, our V, the typical scale of the potential. This one? Now this is, uh, this is k, this is the norm of k, this norm of k, and then u is the unit vector along this. This is the point r, yeah. Okay, so uh, we can of course relate this, we can extract scattering amplitudes out of this, and uh, in particular we can extract this, uh, this f that we have there. So, uh, what do we get? We get fk, which depends on angles. This is minus 1 over 4 pi, d3r prime. This is to minus i k out, uh, dotted into r prime. So what is k out? This thing here is k out. Right, so momenta are, the norm of momenta are conserved in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Uh, the only thing that happens is they get reoriented. So this is, uh, the incoming particle comes this way with, mom with momentum of norm k, and it goes off in, uh, in the r direction. So this is k out. And then there is u of r prime, and then e to i k in dot r prime. So that's the first term. The next term, so th this guy goes in here. Uh, this one becomes minus a quarter, minus 1 over 4 pi. And then uh, this repeats, minus i k out dot r prime, u of r prime, g plus of r prime minus r double prime. Um, u of r double prime, e to i k n dotted into r double prime. So uh, notice that I used this expansion of g only for the g that carries an argument that goes all the way to infinity, whereas the guy that sits in the middle and has both its arguments sampling the range of the potential, that one is left free. Okay, so... Uh, then we can take this and uh, match that against what, uh, uh, what we were given. Can I take a few more minutes past the 15? Hmm, sorry? Oh. oh, okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, then I can actually raise the blackboard properly. <laughs> All right. So, again, this U here has this expansion in epsilon that we had. So uh, matching that against this will tell us the following. So fk comma 1, which is the first term in here, well, the potential that we have starts out as a power of epsilon. So here there are two potentials, so the second term is irrelevant. The first guy is the one that matters. So this is minus 1 over 4 pi integral the 3 r prime uh, 
and then this is u1. So just for definiteness. Okay, so uh, for lack of a better name, we call this thing Q, and it stands for momentum transfer. So clearly, U1 is what you might expect, right? It's the inverse Fourier transform of the leading order of the first term in the amplitude that we are given with respect to this momentum transfer. So let me write this schematically, U1, U1 of R. This is of Q. All right. Now, what about the next order? So the next order, there are two pieces that come in. One is very much like this. So this is U2 of R prime. But then there is an extra piece that comes from the second term. And this one does not obviously depend only on Q. It depends on an SIK out dot R prime. So this is U1 of R prime, G plus. U1 again of R double prime into I, K, N dot R double prime. Right, so uh, the moral of this little story is that this is the guy we want because we don't know it yet, but we can't extract it naively as a Fourier transform of, of F2. There is this extra little annoyance here that has to be subtracted out of F2 before we do the Fourier transform to actually construct U2. This thing goes by the name, quite unsurprisingly, iterations. Because it's an iteration of the leading order potential. It contains no new information, except that it's severely annoying when extracting U2. OK. And uh, you know, if you want the next order, you can, of course, proceed. You will need the third term in this expansion, and so on and so forth. Right, so uh, this is uh, what we want, basically, is this, just put in field theory context and with all the bells and whistles that GR and so on and so forth. But morally, we want something that's very much analogous to this construction. Any questions? Okay, no questions? So, um, again, just to summarize what do we want here, we want QFT analog of this. And, uh, in fact, we want almost the QFT analog of this, but not exactly of this, but of a slightly simpler problem. Notice that here, Donald handed us the full amplitude. We don't really want the full amplitude unless we want to probe aspects of quantum gravity. And I suggest we don't, at least not for the purpose of this week. Uh, so what we really want is uh, the QFT analog of the classical version of this uh, for the classical part of FK. So in principle, FK could have some H bars in there. We want a suitable classical limit of that and a suitable classical version of this uh, Schrodinger equation. So uh, the next thing that I'm going to talk about for the next five minutes before my welcome is over for the day is classical limit.
which classical limit. Right. All right, so uh, as I alluded to a little earlier, uh, we are used in field theory with the classical limit, which looks like h bar to zero. All right, so uh, this is uh, an interesting limit in itself, if only because h bar carries dimensions. So uh, when one states this, one has to state, I'm taking h bar to zero, but what else am I keeping fixed in the process? So uh, because of this, I am going to cheat. I'm going to cheat my way out and kill h bar from everywhere. h bar is one. I don't want to see h bar. Donald might have a different opinion, uh, or at least he might present this in a slightly different way later in the week. But at least for the purpose of today, let's set h bar equals to one and attempt to understand classical limit in this with this meter stick. All right, so uh, with this, uh, there is another formulation of classical limit which was stated more than 100 years ago by a well-known person by the name of Niels Bohr. And uh, it goes by the name of the correspondence principle. So, the correspondence principle states that classical limit emerges when all conserved quantities are large. Note the stating in this way, it doesn't matter whether H is there or not. So it's, uh, this, this uh, h equals 1 is perfect for this, uh, for this formulation of the classical limit. So uh, what are quantum numbers or conserved quantities in our game? Well, they are momenta, external momenta specifically, which we're going to call p. There are other ones, uh, other conserved quantities. We, so for example, the orbital angular momentum is conserved. Uh, if we have spin, well, L is not conserved separately from S, but uh, one can imagine adiabatically taking the spin to zero, and then L is conserved, and then uh, turning on S, uh, and then uh, one would conclude that these also have to be large. Okay. So let's leave the, oh, if you have also a uh, body of finite size, uh, we need to worry a little bit about uh, finite, about the size, right? Um, they should also be large in some units. All right, so uh, let's see what we make out of this uh, little observation. How do we turn this uh, uh, correspondence principle into something that we can actually work with? So uh, L, the orbital uh, angular momentum. Let's make a diagram here. So this is this is a typical uh, hand-drawn trajectory of a scattering <laughs> particle, and um, there is some incoming momentum here, which, for lack of a better name, we're going to call P. Uh, in the literature, it's sometimes called p infinity, just to emphasize that it's the momentum at infinity. Of course, it changes along the way. Uh, and then this is the impact parameter b. Uh, and b, if you think about quantum mechanical scenario here, b and the transfer momentum, they are Fourier conjugates to each other. And uh, because of this, uh, if you have b of some value, then uh, that value should be of the same order as uh, 1 over q. Otherwise, any Fourier transform that would involve e to the i q times b will be 0 because the thing will oscillate to nothing. All right, so what's the angular momentum? Uh, at least in norm and at infinity, it looks very much like b times p or p infinity. I might consider putting cross products and so on. This doesn't change anything. So uh, we want L much larger than 1 
Incidentally, in this unit, L is dimensionless, so it makes sense to call L larger than 1. So uh, this implies that B is much larger than 1 over P. I think. Yeah, it does. All right. So uh, let's see. Does this relation, can, can we reinterpret this relation in a slightly different way? We're going to introduce Q in a second, but before getting... Before getting there, this also has another physical interpretation, especially if we recognize the right-hand side as something else. Imagine that you add an H bar here, or maybe just an H, right? So this is called the De Broglie wavelength, sometimes called lambda. So uh, large orbital angular momentum simply says that the separation of the particles, or rather the typical separation of the particles, is much larger than the De Broglie wavelength of the particles itself. So that makes a lot of sense. You know, we have wave functions or wave packets for each of the two particles. If those wave packets overlap enough, then quantum effects should be important. If they don't overlap, which is what this says, quantum effects should be largely irrelevant. OK, great. So uh, now that we understood this also a little bit more intuitively, what, does, what follows out of this if we replace B by 1 over Q? It says that Q is much larger, much smaller than P. All right, so uh, this is the regime that we want to be in, in a scattering, in a two-to-two -two scattering amplitude. If we are, so we want the momentum that's being exchanged between one and two, call this Q. We want this to be much smaller than the momentum of the incoming particles. So this. Uh, Sometimes this is referred to a soft exchange. Uh, it's going to become soft region in a lecture or two, but uh, never mind that. This also for people who care about particle physics, um, this is also somewhat related to the Regi limit. All right, so uh, how do we, okay, so we learned that we need to look in the region in which Q is much smaller than P. So. This also says that we really don't care about scattering amplitudes for all values of Q. We care only about the pieces of scattering amplitudes which survive in this limit, if we think of them as an expansion at small Q. So this will be something that will come back in, uh, uh, in a little while, though not today. So uh, now, So how many powers of Q do we need to keep in each scattering amplitude? Again, this is a 2 to 2 scattering amplitude. So uh, how many powers of Q do we need to keep? Well, let's think. We can take Newton's potential, never mind the masses, and we can rewrite this in momentum space, just Fourier transform it. And clearly, Newton potential, Newton's potential is a classical object, right? Newton found it by sitting under a tree, or so the story goes. So um, anyway, so its Fourier transform is G divided by Q square. So clearly, out of, uh, uh, clearly out of uh, some amplitude that has this dependence on G, we need to keep only this guy. We don't care about any other dependence on Q. Because if we do, if we keep other powers of Q, like smaller ones, then uh, it won't be this potential. It will be something else which is no longer classical. So with this and with this observation, we can write the typical form of the Fourier transform of the potential. So that's 1 over Q to the third. And there's a sum here. And then some coefficients, call them ci, g, q to the power i. So uh, the reason I put a third here is because g It's the same thing. All right. So uh, from, our little from our little discussion, we should be aiming at a potential that looks like this. And in particular, we should also be aiming at computing scattering amplitudes that look like this. For that many powers of G, we should have that many powers of Q. Uh, whenever you see Q to the even, uh, you should think of uh, Q to the even times log Q. 
And the reason for that is that if you Fourier transform Q to the even back to position space, you're going to find something that you don't like. You're going to find a collection of delta functions and derivatives of delta functions, which basically say that the, part, that the two particles sit on top of each other, and that's exactly the regime where we didn't want to be. All right, so uh, this is... Uh, this is the potential or the part of scattering amplitudes that we're going to aim at computing. Now, my time is up, but uh, I still need a minute to comment on this G dependence, right? So this sum here runs from one to whenever our energy runs out, basically. Uh, but um, the point is that it's not only linear in G. And the reason linear in G is something that one might care about is that if one looks at anything that's three level with two particle, two matter particles coming in, two par matter particles coming out, this is G. So uh, clearly, this is given by more than just three level scattering amplitudes with two field particles coming in, two particles coming out. It is in fact something that's given by loop amplitudes. This powers of G's with that many external external particles, it only comes from loop amplitudes. So uh, how does that match with um, the fact that uh, you were told at some point in time that it's only three level amplitudes that matter in the classical limit? Well, the story is that in the usual classical limit in which uh, only three level matters, none of this holds. In fact, the angular momentum itself is not large, but it is itself of order h bar. And uh, consequently, uh, this limit is not, the, that classical limit will not have separation much larger than the de Broglie wavelength. In fact, it will have a separation which is of the order of the de Broglie wavelength. So focusing only on the three amplitudes in that case, it's a way of saying, I'm focusing on this, but I know very well that I should also include quantum effects because uh, the separation of particles is uh, of the same order as the de Broglie wavelength of each particle. So uh, that is uh, the story for today. Uh, I would like you to remember this until next time we meet, I guess. Uh, thank you. Any quick questions? Could you repeat his question? Yeah, so uh, I made this very cryptic comment here that, you know, if I is even, then there is a, so if I is odd, there is, there are Q to, or to even powers here. The only one that's actually a, a counterexample to what I said here is I equals one, right? So we know that the Fourier transform of one over Q squared is one over R. But uh, let's, let's think for a second. Let's think for a second what happens if we Fourier transform Q to the zero, right? So that is uh, just delta of R. Right, so this says that we are actually not in the regime that we wanted. We are in a regime in which the separation of the particles is morally zero. The two particles are on top of each other. So for Q even here, uh, just writing this formula is in fact not what we want because we, we still want to enforce this for all powers of Q. So one might ask what exactly, how can I modify the powers of Q here so that I maintain the separation without changing the scaling, the dependence on Q? And that's really the only thing that one can do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Can you repeat this question? Uh, I, I can try to repeat the question. I'm yeah, not sure I understood I it properly. So uh, the question is, 
uh, about the classical limit. So, Okay, so the question is, the usual classical limit says that the quadratic part of the Lagrangian or of the action dominates over the interactions. So what's the connection between that and uh, what I'm blabbing about here? So uh, it's enough to change variables here. If you change, so th this is, let's talk about bosons, but it doesn't really matter. So the quadratic part is something like this, some phi, some quadratic operator phi. So imagine that we scale here phi square root of h bar curly phi. Then uh, this thing, there are some powers of h bar here that don't matter because of normalization. Curly phi e to i, so h bar goes away. And integral curly phi box curly phi. And then L int will have at least one power of uh, h bar in front. Right? So uh, the usual limit h bar goes to zero, in which this guy dominates, is basically in this, in this language says that, well, h bar is here, I'm going to set it to zero, this is the relevant part. OK. So, uh, where does this uh, where does this fail in this language? So if you were to restore h bars in here, and Donald, I, I'm sure will explain it at some point. <laughs> uh, sorry, Donald. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you restore h bars here, then you will notice that in the quadratic part there will be h bars morally because we want, say, large masses, and we want classical masses, which are themselves of order 1 over h bar. So if we keep that in mind, then this limit is not going to be right anymore. The one, this rescaling is not going to introduce a clean separation between interactions and uh, uh, the quadratic part because there are h bars floating around in here. So this is, at least intuitively, this is why one has to be a little bit more careful when one takes h bar to zero in the presence of large quantum numbers. Perhaps we should stop here and leave out the questions for the discussion section later today. So let's thank Redu again. Thank you.